Introducing Recorded Content, a podcast for small, scrappy B2B marketing teams who want to get the most out of podcasting. In each episode, we capture stories from industry experts and podcasters. Listen in and uncover what it takes to launch, run, and grow a successful B2B podcast. Check out and subscribe to the show on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Let's jump in. Hey, this is Tristan. I'm the co-founder of Motion and your host for this episode of Recorded Content. Recorded Content is brought to you by Motion, a done-for-you podcast agency for small, scrappy B2B tech marketers. Everyone is working remotely now. Platforms like Zoom are used for customer calls, team meetings, and podcasts. And we are all using video to communicate. But most people are using terrible webcams, and they don't realize that they have an amazing camera right in their pocket. So that's why Camo was created. Camo unlocks the power of your phone's camera and allows you to use it for applications like Zoom and for recording higher quality remote podcasts. Today, I have Aiden Fitzpatrick, the CEO of Reincubate. In this episode, we'll learn about Reincubate's powerful software called Camo, and we'll talk about how this product can help you get better looking videos when you record remotely. Let's jump in to see how it all works. You started Reincubate with a backup or disaster recovery, right? Application for iPhone devices. So can you talk about, was it a problem that you experienced yourself or like, where did that stem from? Yeah, absolutely. So I was uh, an early iPhone adopter. I used to have one of those smashing Motorola Razor devices, you know, the the beautiful little clamshell ones. And um, when I got my iPhone, of course, I was very excited with it. And I spent a long time manually entering all of my contacts into it. I I didn't have too many, but I I got them all in there. Um, And one of the early iOS updates just erased them all. I lost all my data. I think it was the update to iOS 2 or to 201 or something like that. Um, And I just couldn't stomach typing my contacts back in again. So I... Yeah, especially on a phone, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wasn't... I'm still not very quick, to be honest, on the on-screen keyboard on an iPhone. Um, so basically, I just I kind of took apart how it worked and I built this script to recover my data because I thought there must be some trace of it left on the computer by iTunes. Um, and sure enough, there was. You know, the only option you get for iTunes is delete everything on your phone and restore a backup. Um, but I found a way to put, selectively pull that data out and put it back on the phone. Um, so I, I did that for me. This was early 2008. And then there was another iOS update, which was 2.1. And again, it zapped all of my data. So I, I put this script on the web. Um, and that led to a lot of people writing in every night. Um, I built it in a language called Python. And so people wrote into me and said, what is a Python? And can you help me get my data back? Um, and it, it, it was just overwhelming. But that, that was really the genesis of the company. Um, I was overemployed at the time. Um, and I was getting about 30 emails a night. And I loved to help people. And I was passionate about what I'd made. Um, yeah. So what I did is I said, look, send me 20, 25 bucks of PayPal. I'll build you your own version of this software and send it to you. Because I thought that would just sort of completely cut down on people reaching out to me. So I might get one or two a week. Um, and actually, they I got wired about... Um, well, north of a million bucks in about 18 months. And that was... Goodness gracious. Okay. That was, that was the start of it. <laughs> That's some, uh, some validation as far as your, your idea, for sure. It sounds like it. Well, good. So, yeah. you, so you, you were wired this money. You're, you're solving problems for, for your customers that, that you didn't even know how many you were going to have. And I know the company has evolved, right? You, you've pulled in some other ideas and, and have developed a, really a suite of products at Reincubate. So, so where do these ideas come from now, given that you started with this data recovery piece, but, but now ideas are, are seemingly coming from everywhere. So how does that work? Yeah, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a chronic builder. Uh, I, I like to build things and we do skunk works projects in the business. So every year we, we build a couple of things, um, generally in secret, generally with a subset of the team or some newer contributors, because we don't want to interfere with kind of the day-to-day support mm-hmm. and development of, of, of products that we already have. And the, the question is, can, can we build something that's compelling and interesting and that solves a problem? And 
something I find with, with the kind of creative processes, it, it's very hard to find things that work. It may just be about my own skill in doing it, but you've got you've to throw a lot of stuff before you get an idea that, that sticks and works and resonates. Um, and so there's, there's, there's this kind of process we go through. And, and I do think that products are really expressions of opinions. You have to be quite opinionated. You have to have some fairly strong feelings about a space so that you feel there's a way it can be done better. And essentially what I'm doing with those projects is, well, proving whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. Uh, and every now and then I'm right. <laughs> and that's, that, that then is where, where a new product comes from. Very nice. And and that's a good segue to, to Camo. And you mentioned just now, Aiden, that the products you create are often an expression of opinion. So what is your opinion on the state of footage online today with uh, everyone being remote, especially in this last year? I mean, what, yeah. Let's start there with the, the challenge folks are having. Yeah, well, I suppose that the first opinion is there are no good webcams. There just aren't. And there's a strange mental block that I think people have. You can go on YouTube and you can look at a, a comparison between a, a Logitech and a Razer and your people are saying, wow, this, this, this webcam is clearly better or we love this one. But what they're not doing is they're not comparing it to broadcast quality. And I find it hard to understand why, because as soon as you say, well, look, does it look like this guy looks like on Netflix? The answer is no. It's like, hey, that the window behind you is blown out. The colors in your face is wrong. It's smoothing your skin or doing something weird. Um, there are all these terrible, strange things. And, and you have to install this software that's basically like malware on your computer to control it. Um, so that, that's kind of really the, the first theme. and. We were largely based in an office in the UK at the start of COVID, and we, we sent people home very early. And being a company that deals a lot with Mac stuff, we all had you know the latest MacBooks. We had some you know high-end webcams and that sort of thing. And I really wanted not to have any barriers between the team that was sort of unnecessary. I wanted to be able to sort of see people accurately. And I think seeing people accurately isn't about crystal clear resolution. It's not about super high def or being able to see the pores in people's skin, but it's about kind of reflecting how they really look. And I think when you're messing around with coloring or smoothing of skin, or you've got problems with light and contrast, it just, you're not, you're not getting the truth. Um, and I don't know a lot about photography or, or I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I set out to find experts to, Try and answer the question, you know, why are, why are there no good webcams and what, <laughs> what, what do the professionals do? Uh, and the answer is, as you know, is, you know, the professionals tend to have professional camera equipment. They will have DSLR or mirrorless cameras. And there's a whole kind of spectrum of devices like that. Um, you could have something for, say, $1,000 or, you know, like a, a Sony DSLR, mm -hmm. or you could have a proper RED camera for $80,000. And they're not all the same, but broadly speaking, if you point one of these things at yourself, you'll look much better than you will a webcam. And, and so kind of the pro solution is a two and a half grand, give or take setup, which involves quite a lot of complication and isn't something that everyone has. And, and I was just kind of, I was frustrated that it's like, okay, we, we can get a webcam for 50 bucks or 200 bucks. And they're basically all the same, yeah. or we can spend two and a half thousand dollars. How can I, you know, how, how can I talk with a team uh, without buying everyone a DSLR camera? Right. Um, and so we got, we got speaking to Jeff Carlson, who is um, an incredibly accomplished photographer and author and, podcast host and writer and trainer and all those sorts of things but but he is mr camera and and he kind of um wrote up this report for us where he did a lot of comparisons and essentially where we ended up was was understanding that when you have an iphone in your pocket you, you've got something that really is effectively broadcast quality you know lady gaga 
records music videos of the thing. Billie Eilish did her last music video with them. Mm-hmm. The audio on them is, is pretty good and a lot better than built-in audio on the computer, but the video is really spectacular. Um, so we set out essentially to, to demonstrate, is there a way we can harness this capability for, for ordinary users? That, that's kind of how I went from the opinion then to, to trying to prove that opinion. Got it. So Aiden, it, it was your own team. So you saw this gap, you know, COVID pandemic situation around the world, and you had this issue with your own team. And that's where the, the spark came from? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that was the genesis of it. it. It was something that I'd, you know, I keep a long list of these projects. And this is something I've wanted to do for a couple of years, but the, the time really became right. Okay. And then so so you did some research, and, and you have this opinion, right? And when did you say, hey, all right, we are going to build a solution for this, or we're going to try? Like, when did you say we are going to tackle this on our side? Yeah, so that that was, um, I think, early March. It, it was pretty much immediately because I was so frustrated that we just keep kept having these terrible Zoom calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, I just wanted to put an end to it. Right. Um, and w- it it took maybe two months um, for us to be able to prove the concept. And it, it was it was an interesting one because there were a few products that have been, you know, if you take the, 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 the use case at its simplest, can you use your iPhone as a webcam? There are a couple of products that have been around a while that let you do that in a very basic way. But the question I had wasn't, is it kind of technically feasible to do a basic version of that? It was, can you make a great product experience that just works and that works with the sort of software that you want to use and that doesn't kind of look like malware and involve a lot of fiddling with the command line and that Zoom isn't compatible with. Because that was that was the situation when we started. Like you, you could kind of yeah. make the basics work, but it, it just it, it wasn't at all usable. Um, so yeah, we, we set out in March, it took us about two months um, before we got to a position where we thought we can probably do this. Got it. And so what did it, like the early versions of the product look like? Like what were some of those things you mentioned it, it uh, being compatible with Zoom was important. Uh, like what were some of the major factors that you made sure that you wanted to fold in from a feature standpoint for that early version? Sure. Well, so something that was completely new and innovative about it was I spent a lot of time thinking about how to control it because all of the, you know, the the three or four apps that could do this were basically apps you'd run on your phone and there was nothing on your Mac or your Windows computer. Which doesn't help if you're, you're using the phone as a camera. Yeah. Right. So you'd have to take it down and fiddle with it. And, And that just isn't workable. So I knew I wanted software on the Mac that could do all of the controls. I didn't want any controls at all on the iOS app. So whilst behind the scenes, a lot of the cleverness is in the iOS app, actually there, there aren't any controls, right? We expect you to, to mount your iPhone, your dedicated iPhone or, or you know your, your daily driver to put it up in the mountain down. But if you're recording on your Mac and, 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 and you know preparing a podcast, recording a, a webinar or a tutorial, we don't want you to take your phone down to adjust it. That's ridiculous. We want the best software there is for managing a webcam, but it will control your iPhone. So that was, I had a very, it it took a lot of thinking, but I built a very clear vision of what I wanted the desktop software to look like and how I wanted it to put what you look like in the center of that and give you controls so that it was very, very clear what you were getting and what impact the adjustments were making. Got it. Yeah. And that was one of the first things I saw um, because I've been using it. and, And I mentioned this, Aiden, when we were you know, going back and forth before we hopped on the, the podcast that I've been using it every day on, on our Zoom. So I have like a dedicated podcast area in my house. And then I have a whole other office where I'm doing like customer calls and things. And uh, I had a really bad webcam because I, I didn't want to set up anything else because I have the DSLR for the podcast, but not everyone can have that. And, yep. and you know, I was talking to you guys and I said, well, this is interesting because I have the ability to control 
I mean, the, the zoom level on, on the app and everything else and, and the color temperature, which people take for granted too. Um, so I was hoping, can you walk us through maybe the, the major differences between the, the iPhone and what a traditional webcam have and, and like the, the major gap in, in that functionality that exists there? Yeah, of, of course. Um, I, I think I think the answer is about thirty years of technological progress. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think you know a lot of these. I think that there are some sort of mountains of industrial components in warehouses across the world that are slowly being put into into webcams, and I think you know a bunch of these things were built or designed a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, part of it is very, very old sensor technology. Um, there are very few devices. I don't think there are any mainstream webcam manufacturers that are using contemporary image sensors. Um, but there are a few little kind of startups or alternative ones that are, and there's quite a popular Sony image sensor they use. The problem is you just can't compete against Apple. Apple spend more on their camera R&D per year than Logitech make in a year mm -hmm. in terms of their gross revenue. So the idea that an image sensor from Sony, you know, you could take Sony's best sensor and put it in the camera, it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's not, you're not going to build a good webcam with that. I mean, now if you take the sort of image sensor that Sony would use in a DSLR, I mean, yes, you are going to have a good experience, but that's, that's a big old, you know, multiple thousand dollar device that's not webcam form factor. Um, so part of it is they just, no one's really capable of building small versions of good cameras other than Apple, I would say. You know, I mean, Google and some of the Android manufacturers have done some pretty good stuff, but it tends not to be as solid. It's not, it's not just a hardware problem. Um, I, think, I think people often kind of say, you know, companies can generally either build hardware or they can build software, but rarely are they good at both. And I think what you often see with a lot of these companies that make webcams is, you know, whatever job they do with their hardware, um, the software is terrible and you have to install drivers. Uh, there's something that's the case with the Logitech cameras. You, you have to tell them what refresh rate your lights are at to stop flicker. You have to go in and say, oh, my lights are at 50 hertz or my lights at 60 hertz. And I just think, well, mm -hmm. how... I mean, if you've got a professional camera, it's one thing, but amateur photographers, if they go out on the street and take a photograph, they don't have to know what frequency the light is. Like, you never have to tell your yeah. iPhone that. It's ridiculous. Um, and there are all these kind of things that flow from that. So something that I found was particularly frustrating is webcams used to have hardware encoding and decoding built in them, which meant that they would do a lot of the image processing. Um, but in the last 10 or 15 years, they've taken that stuff out, which means they send a raw stream of data to your computer and your computer does the processing, which means if you've got a MacBook or something like that and it isn't one of the new M1s, your fan will turn on, the thing will get hot, you'll get noise and interference. Um, yeah. Whereas we're able to do all of the processing on an iPhone because your iPhone actually turns out it's more powerful than your computer. It, the iPhone is incredible. Um, and, and that also extends to the audio capabilities that they have. I mean, the, the iPhone, most of them have got at least three microphones. Uh, they've got stereo, they've got built-in noise cancellation. They've got incredible amounts of machine learning behind them. And, and there's just, I mean, camo is almost cheating. You know, we, we put the image of you first and foremost in the interface, and there's very little we're doing. That, that is Apple's magic for video and Apple's magic for audio. And you know, we've, we've built some stuff around that. We've made the process very smooth, but we're really kind of taking advantage of the brilliance of, of what they've built. Yeah, I love it. And Aiden, can you t walk us through, okay, so if, uh, let's say I'm a head of marketing, right? And, and I'm running a podcast and I'm recording from home. I have a dedicated office. So when I do sit down to use Squadcast, Riverside, or whatever platform to record my video podcast, I think maybe walk us through that setup and how simple it, it, it truly is. Yeah, sh sure. I mean, to, to get Cam up and running, you, it, uh, you install it from the App Store. 
on an iPhone or on an iPad or, or on many iPhones and many iPads. Uh, and then there's an app that runs uh, on your Windows computer or on your Mac called Camo Studio. Uh, and essentially what you do is you, you run Camo Studio on the, on the computer and you run Camo on the mobile device and you can connect multiple mobile devices. You then mount them and forget about them. Uh, and the Mac or PC gives you complete control. So you can switch between multiple cameras. You can pan, crop, zoom. You can adjust color balance. Um, you can enable portrait mode. You know, if, if you're seeing this on video, I, I've kind of got it running now. We're, we're using uh, the iPhone's processing to kind of slightly blur my background. I'm, I'm running a beta version now, uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, is, it is in the current release. But yeah, I mean, you, you just you run Camo. Uh, it's very, very simple software, or it's designed to be a very simple experience for the user. Um, and your Mac or Windows computer will see this as a virtual camera. It'll, it'll appear as if it's a camera that's ordinarily connected. So if you're using Squadcast or a product like that, um, you know you, you just start up the call as usual, or start up the session in your camera choice. You can choose Reincubate Camera, and you're away. It's it's really as simple as that, um, and that will feed both uh, video and and audio. Um, we, we support uh, audio from the phone on on macOS. Uh, it's coming to Windows very soon, um, and that's that's pretty powerful too. Very nice. Yeah. And, and, and maybe paint a picture like what the difference is. You talked a little bit about this in the beginning where, you know, with, with a webcam, you're, you're going to traditionally see a window blown out or some, you know, the side of someone's face just overexposed. And, you know, maybe paint a picture for folks about the, the difference and how you can you can see with the, the iPhone a more natural look versus what you would see, you know, in a traditional webcam. Yeah, I mean, it's, so there are a bunch of things you'll typically see on a webcam. Um, so uh, Logitech cameras in particular tend to make people pink. They do this thing where they recolor your skin. They're working towards a, it, it seems to be that they've got, they've got some processing that's working towards some sort of ideal skin color algorithm, which I, I, I'm not entirely down with. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not quite it, right. <laughs> no, um, you, you know, if, if you're paler complected, it, it kind of makes you uh, uh, pink, really, you know, uh, quite an unusual pink. Um, whereas, you know, if, if you take a, a photograph of yourself with an iPhone, I, th I think most people will kind of recognize their own complexion in that shot. Um, if you have light on your face or you have a light source behind you, uh, a webcam will typically not be able to handle that exposure well. And, and what that will do is that will kind of possibly make part of your face look brilliant white and the rest of it look darker. Uh, or it might change how absolute blacks or absolute whites are shown in that shot. S similarly, if you're in low light and, uh, you know, a lot of people are not in ideal lighting conditions. So, you know, had, had we known that uh, a lot of us would be working from home and recording from home, we'd mm. possibly have better studio setups than we do. Um, but unless you're well lit with a series of key lights, you may well be in a kind of a low light environment. Uh, and that will create a lot of graininess um, in webcam images, typically. It, it, what you'll find is the colors will go quite close together. There'll be a flatness of the image. Uh, and, and there'll be a graininess. I think the iPhones are a lot better at, at dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Aiden, what, what challenges did you all have when you were putting together the software? Like what major roadblocks did you, <laughs> did you run into? I'm sure there were a few, but. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, need, need for sleep was, was <laughs> definitely one. That's, of them. that's a given. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, we were trying to do, we were trying to pull this stuff together in a way that hadn't been done before. And it, it meant we had to use a bunch of technologies in ways they weren't intended originally. Um, so, you know, Apple have a framework for creating virtual cameras, which is to say to, to expose a camera on a Mac that, uh, you know, is controlled by software. And Zoom and WebEx, and a couple of other companies didn't support virtual cameras. So the first obstacle was, you know, if, if we build this product, we'll assume a lot of people will be using it in video conferencing tools. 
Uh, and a lot of them will be wanting to use Zoom. So we, we can't build it unless Zoom support it. Right. So w one of those first challenges was simply trying to persuade Zoom to let these crazy guys in the UK ship this product, and make it work. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I have sort of depth that I can call upon to be uh, persuasive and irritating. And I, I got to know a lot of the Zoom uh, <laughs> leadership team. And uh, I, I think possibly at the end of the day, it was it was easier to make these changes than, than have this English guy keep keep calling out. <laughs> They're like, um, we got to get rid of this guy. Yeah, let's <laughs> <know>. let him <laughs> stop, stop putting him through. Um, so we, we got Zoom on board, and that was awesome. Uh, we we had some great support from Google. Um, you know, companies like Brave with their browsers supported us. Um, we just got support from WebEx. Uh, that, that was quite a lengthy project. Um, so there was all this stuff that wasn't technical. It was, it was just about relationship building and persuasion. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, then, then the case of um, starting to see how people uh, reacted to this, which was in incredibly helpful um, because we wanted to get a handle on, you know, what are they going to use it for and how are they going to use it? And, and something that surprised us is there are a lot of people running Mac OS 1013, uh, which I think is called High Sierra and is at least a couple of years old. And, and so we had an additional set of challenges to kind of support this uh, architecture and computers that were a little bit older, because of course, Apple, you know, change what you're able to do every, every year with their updates. Yeah. And it's very tempting to do things the latest and greatest way. Um, so there was there was certainly a bit of challenge there. And, and then, you know, we had a bunch of problems like letting people be able to do crazy stuff like changing your resolution whilst you're using the camera um, or performing adjustments like that. Things that you can do with camera that you can't do with a webcam. Um, but we, we, we got through it. We got through it. Um, yeah. And, I, and that's, it sounds like some, some user feedback there. And that's one of the first things that I noticed was just the ability to, to zoom in a little bit. Like if I'm getting ready to, to get on a phone call and I have something on my desk, back, I don't really want to clean it up. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, tilt the camera and then boom, I'm all set versus with a webcam, you're pretty much locked in. And right. they're so wide often that you just see everything that's behind you. It's all in focus. I mean, your, your face is in as much focus as, you know, whatever is behind you in the background. And, and I think that's a big advantage too, is just the ability to make those subtle adjustments before you hop on a phone call. Um, and that, that stuff matters sometimes, you know? Um, and, and that leads me to a question for you. What advice would you have? So now that you put together camo, what advice do you have for people to to make the most of their environment to get the the best looking video footage for a podcast or or even a meeting that they might be having with a client? I, th I think that the most important thing for looking good is lighting uh, and lighting that's you know appropriate to the scene and appropriate to the nature of the meeting. Um, lighting makes the best of just about every camera. Um, and so generally, the better lit you are, uh, the better the outcome will be. Um, an another opinion that I have, speaking of opinions and product opinions, is yeah. I'm not a big believer in virtual backgrounds. Uh, I think I understand the rationale for them, but I think they generally don't work well, and I think they're jarring, and I think they're inauthentic. So... I guess my, my second kind of piece of advice after good lighting is embrace your background. You know, it, it's not ideal for everyone in every situation, but I, I think sometimes there are, you know, I, I guess it depends a bit about what's in your background and, mm -hmm. you know, tidying up uh, can help, but, you know, they can also be kind of like a simple artful arrangement of things and, and you can maybe shoot yourself in a scene where your background is quite close cropped um, or there's less of a wide shot and that can be yeah. quite helpful. It's also helpful to have surfaces that you can bounce light off in some situations. I mean, I'm, I'm using quite a contrived setup here. If, if, if you can see how I look, this isn't, you know, how I'd look in every type of call, but um, 
you know, it, it, it can be good to experiment with, with, with different setups. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing too, because I have, I have a video background and, and the, the best thing is to just create the most natural light as, as possible. You know, I think a lot of people try to manufacture light in a way that mm -hmm. causes overexposure a lot of times. And be, I, I know these ring lights are, are very popular. And, yes. but the, the thing with those is they're, they're so bright on the, the foreground, you know, the subject that you, you don't see anything in the background. I think that goes to your point where it's best to just have this natural environment as much as possible. And, and the one thing I, I try to convey with folks is, is to, you know, bounce light off things and try to get a soft, maybe even a soft box versus a, a ring light that's directly shining on, on your face, you know, where the, the light is just so harsh. And I think that's what the iPhone does a good job of. It, it's, it's more of a natural color temperature and, and even the white balance right out of the box is, is pretty good. I mean, that's the first thing I saw when I, I put my iPhone on a little tripod, connected camo, and I'm like, wow, just just the out-of-the-box white balance and, and my skin tone is so much better <laughs> than my Logitech that I had just hooked up downstairs. Yeah. And and I think that's a big deal for, for folks. It, it is that skin tone that People don't really, it, in a, when they're looking at an image, they can't really tell what's off about it, but that's really what it is. It, it's that skin tone that that's so much different and, and the colors are, are just not quite right. But the iPhone just has that that natural image that comes across really well. No, I, I, I think you're quite right. And, and the point about diffuse light is a very good one because I think people kind of often go on a journey where they go out and they get a... You know, they, they, they get something they call a key light or they get two key lights mm -hmm. and they, they might have them kind of beamed from uh, slightly above their point of sight. And, um, you know, I mean, there are many challenges you can get from that, from being shiny to giving yourself headaches, to having a bright light in your eyes. Yeah. And one of the things that we find quite well is even if you have a fairly basic light, like an angle poise light, and you put paper lampshade over that you know there are simple techniques like that that really kind of soften things or, or indeed pointing pointing the light at the wall as you say and just having it having it bounce back can make a big difference i mean in this scene I'm, I've, I've got some kind of synth wavy stuff going on i've got some direct light so this isn't this isn't the best yeah. example of that um but that that does work well for a natural setting and, and when we do our product photography and our, our kind of sample shots you know that's done by a big window with a lot of diffuse lights and that's that's really the only way we'll do it yeah and and aiden what do you recommend as far as mounting the iphone so people let's say they, they have camo they have their iphone yep. they're all set they got the usb cable what what uh what about mounting yeah so we um when we built this uh <laughs> we, we couldn't find any good guidance on that so we bought literally everything on amazon uh, and a couple of third-party products as well, and experimented. And the, the upshot is the best thing is probably a gooseneck mount. Um, and that's just like a kind of a very simple uh, clamp that won't hurt a desk or monitor stand connected to a, a thick bendy cable that will clip a phone into it. Um, and, and that works pretty well if you have a, a desktop setup or if you have a laptop setup. Um, some laptop users will use a tripod and you can get a little uh, clip for that. We've, we've got a, a guide on our site, as I said, that kind of goes through this, but, but generally a gooseneck just, just kind of works. I like that. Yeah. And I, I actually, when I got camo, I went on Amazon, did the same thing that you mentioned. And I got two uh, iPhone tripods. One of them I, I hate um, totally, but I, I think I might get the, the arm, the flexible arm. Cause I also have a very similar thing for, for my mic as well. And it just gives you the ability to make a, a quick adjustment versus a tripod. You have to, you have to physically get up out of your chair. You have to walk around, you have to adjust it. So I think that's the big thing there with the, the gooseneck, you just grab it, tilt it a little bit, move it and, and you're all set. And, and I don't think everyone realizes how much of a difference that means to just kind of stay on the call and make that small adjustment. Yeah, it helps for eye contact as well, because depending on what you do with a gooseneck, you know, you can position the phone so that, you know, if you can make eye contact with a lens or eye contact with the speaker as you work, as opposed to kind of having it off to one side. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have like some of these suggestions here. I mean, what do you feel like uh, people are, are going to do now that, 
you know, we're all remote for the most part now, but when maybe workplace changes, like where, where does the remote recording and, um, kind of your, your home environment, where does this all fit maybe going forward? What's your, what's your opinion there in this case? <laughs> sure. I, I don't think we're going back, uh, to the way things were. I think people have had an opportunity to see a different way of work or a lot of people have, and you know, certainly in the UK, everyone's been home for a long time and we're all crazy to get out and maybe go back to an office. Yeah. But, you know, from a practical perspective, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, it, it would be nice to see more of co-workers. It would be nice to get out. It would be nice to not have one's entire existence at home. But I, I, I just can't see it happening. You know, people are not having to spend on commutes. They're having more time uh, with their family, with their partners. Their quality of life is greater. Um, I think there's definitely a need to see co-workers from, from time to time in person, and there'll be elements of that. But I think I think really the time where people are going to be, a lot of these people are fully based at home, is, is, has, has probably passed. Um, you know, we've taken the opportunity to work with more people who aren't in the UK. Um, and whilst we're going to physically get our, our team together uh, at a number of points in the future, where, you know, it's, it's, it's just not practical to, to get them all in one room on an ongoing basis. And, and, and they wouldn't want to do so either. You know, they've, able to, they've been able to make some kind of lifestyle choices that suit them better, that don't include commuting into London every day. Um, so, you know, clearly there will be some people who are, who are, who are back in offices, but I, I, think, I think there's going to be a very big market of people who aren't in an office all the time, and I think if anything for them, it's going to be all the more important um, because they'll have more time and, and more thought to put into how they look and how they present at those times when they are remote. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I think, I don't think this is going away at all. Yeah, I would agree. And, and I think to, to your point, even if there is a, an in-person element that, that's put back in, people are going back into the office. I just think that that remote component will always be there moving forward. And, and I think this becomes a part of getting your home environment or your home office set up comfortable so that it's very quick. You know, you can set it up, it's ready to go. It, it looks good. And, and you're confident that when you either go into a meeting or you're recording a podcast that, you know, everything's going to work and, it, and it's going to look good. And I don't have to spend a lot of time testing it is, is something that people are going to be looking for. And, and that kind of leads me to my point um, or my next question, Aiden, is with camo, let, let's say I am a head of marketing, I have a small team, you know, I want to get my sales team on board with, with this, like, what does it look like to roll camo out? Like, how quickly is it for maybe a small team to get this rolled out within their own company? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really quite straightforward. It, it tends to be quite driven by individuals. Um, but we, we've got a whole bunch of sales and marketing people, um, a number of big companies as well using camo. And yeah, I mean, it's typically organically driven. They, they stick it on the phone, they, they stick it on the Mac, um, and then they're away. It really is a, a five minute setup. So there's not, there's not kind of a big logistical thing to organize. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm not, as you can probably tell Tristan, I, I'm not a big picture. I'm a product guy. Yeah. Uh, and I don't really feel like we put a lot of energy into selling camo. I feel like we put a lot of energy into building a product that will give people an amazing experience. And, you know, a lot of what camo does is available in the free version. So like we're, we're really not tremendously focused in saying, Hey, you know, you guys should buy this thing cause you need it. It's more like, look, it's download it, install it, use it. It's free. It, it'll almost certainly give you what you want. And, and I think they're then a bunch of users that kind of self-select into identifying as pros or wanting some of the more power feature bits. So, you know, I, I think in terms of getting a marketing or a sales team on it, you could just put it on, it's free. It, it'll probably do what you want. Um, and, and then where it's like, Hey, can we license this for the organization? You know, I mean, that's a great step to take. And that's a conversation we, we, we like to have and it's, it's not mm -hmm. too expensive. Yeah. Um, but it, but it's really kind of not a necessary bridge to cross. Um, in terms of answering the question, can my organization get better video with this? Um, and is it something we can use easily? Yeah, 
Absolutely. And, and so with that implementation there, you know, making it easy to roll out with a company, I mean, what, what's on the horizon for camo and, and maybe even reincubate here? Cause I know you, you have a lot of opinions, right? And that's where all your ideas are stemming <laughs> from. So, so what else is, uh, is kind of moving around in, in your head at the moment? Oh, well, there's an awful lot we want to do with the product. Um, I mean, there's more that we want to do with a portrait mode, which, as I said, is the, is the technique where we kind of give you background, a bit of a softer blur to create that impression of distance. Um, we, we've got some, uh, well, we need to ship audio on Windows, and that's going to happen uh, in the coming month or so. Um, we're going to enable 4K recording uh, and variable frame rates so that you can dynamically change the frame rate that you're recording at. Um, rather than having it kind of locked in place to, to a single rate. Um, and we've got some pretty cool stuff coming up with, with some of the filters, um, uh, and some techniques like virtual, uh, like, like face tracking, for instance. Uh, that, that's going to be there. Um, and I'm also expecting we'll, we'll have a couple more integrations. Um, so that, that's kind of in the core product. Um, we are currently in beta with Camo for Android. Um, which sounds uh, similar. You would have thought if you've done one, why, why would the other be hard? Uh, yeah. But it's really quite challenging for Android, mainly because there are a lot of very different Android devices and uh, smooth connectivity is quite difficult to, to do in a way that just works. So mm -hmm. at the moment with Camo, you know, we, we do it over the wire because we don't like interruptions from wireless. We want to make it simple. We want to keep the device charging and not allow for those interruptions. But with the advent of Android, we will ship wireless functionality. Mm, and, okay. you know, we know what a bad outcome is. A bad outcome is building a product where you can be recording or doing something live and you're interrupted. Yeah. Uh, and we never want that to happen. So it's, 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 got, to, it's got to be in the oven for <laughs> long enough uh, before we ship that. All right. Yeah, very cool. And I think, um, you know, when I was talking to some of your folks at Reincubate, they mentioned that the Android was was uh, currently in the works there. So I know it's a completely different set, set of challenges for sure. So, well, good. Well, Aiden, we're, we're coming up on our time here. And, and I wanted to ask, you know, for our listeners, where can folks go to find out more from you and Reincubate as well as Camo? Yeah, sure. Um I mean, the, the best thing to do if you want to try it out uh, is just to search for Camo or Incubate Camo. You will end up on the App Store where you can get it. It's a free app, and you'll see on that page what the uh, Wall Street Journal and what the New York Times and what Daring Fireball have, have had to say about it. They like it, is, is the short version of that. Um, and, you know, you, you can get in touch with me at AFIT, A-F-I-T, on Twitter, uh, or Reincubate on Twitter, uh, or indeed on the web. All right. Awesome. Well, Aiden, I appreciate your time today. It certainly has worked out for me really well, that camo that is. And, um, you know, I know a lot of our listeners are going to appreciate this because just, just out of the box, you know, it's something a lot better than that traditional webcam. So. Thank you very much, Tristan. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure.